Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to our special speakers and all of the audience present here with us today. Welcome to the industrial webinar. Let's explore the next generation sequencing. I am Nurdiana Sineng and I will be the master of ceremony for our event today. It is surely a great day to which may be to some people, but foreign to others. We really appreciate you taking some time of your busy schedules to join us today. Greetings to Associate Professor Dr. Gohohan, Head of Quality Assurance, Institute of System Biology in Biosis, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, as our first speaker. Dr. Muhammad Izwan Ismail, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Applied Sciences, University Technology Mara UITM Campus Muka, as our second speaker. Dr. of BSN 4301 Bioinformatics, Faculty of Biotechnology and Biomolecular Sciences, University Putra, Malaysia. All lecturers that take part in this webinar, Ms. Amira Nurnisa Azmi, Director of Industrial Webinar, let's explore the next generation sequencing. The Committees of Industrial Webinar, let's explore the next generation sequencing. And all of the audience present here with us today, welcome to the Industrial Webinar. Let's explore the next generation sequencing. Ladies and gentlemen, Praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have been graced by the chance to gather in this momentous event. It will go well and smoothly. We would like to invite Mr. Hairu Azimuddin Azmi to recite the dua. Assalamu alaikum. Auzu billahi na shaitan rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafi anbiya ibn musalim wa ala ahli wa sahbihi ajma'in. In the name of Allah, the Magnificent, the Merciful, praise be to Allah, Lord of the world. Let your blessing and your peace be on your servant and your messenger Muhammad and on his family and his companions. Allahumma ya Allah, on this glorious morning, in conjunction with the program Industrial Webinar 2031, let's explore next generation sequencing. We are hold our hands to pray gratefully to thank you on infinite favor to us till we can live in peace and harmony and perform our task as your servant. O oh, Allah, we ask for your blessings. Allahumma ya hayu ya koyum ya zanjalal wa ikram. You are the mercy of the mercies, and you are the Lord of the universe. You give us mercy from your presence and guide them for the light path. We ask you for your knowledge, which is beneficial, and sustenance, which is good, and deeds, which is acceptable. O oh Allah, help us to remember you, to thank you, and to worship you in the best of manners. Forgive us, have mercy upon us, guide us, give us health, and grant us sustenance. Rabbana alayka tawakana wa alayka anabna wa ilayka al-masir. Rabbana aati wa firati hasana wa kina azabana. Wa sallallahu ala sallina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillah wa alhamdulillah. Amin, amin, ya Rabbal Alamin. Thank you, Mr. Hairo, for the dua recitation. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin with our first lot of the webinar, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Associate Professor Dr. Gohohan. Dr. Gohohan is a plant molecular biologist who has expertise in functional genomics. In 2011, he obtained his PhD from University of Sheffield, United Kingdom before starting his first academic position at the Institute of System Biology in Biosis. Upon joining in Biosis, he pioneered the plant functional genomics research group, focusing on the molecular exploration of tropical plants and crop improvement using functional genomics approach. Dr. Goh has been actively involved in various administrative roles from 2014 until now. 
from June 2014, he was the head of Center for Plant Biotechnology, whom contributed to the commissioning of the first PC2 certified greenhouse at UKM before becoming the head of Center for Bioinformatics Research from 2016 to 2019, when he established the Center of Omics Data Analysis, CODA, as a one-stop service provider for omics analysis. He was then appointed as the lab manager created an online consolidated lab management system and laboratory one-stop information corner, OIC, with all the lab officers. Currently, he is the head of quality assurance who oversees the quality management system at InBiosis. Not just that, Dr. Go is also a columnist for New Stress Times that actively contributes to OPEDS in topics ranging from food security to climate change. Dr. Goh has some remarkable achievements, which include publishing 58 index journal articles and seven books with a hash index of 13 and 517 citations. Dr. Goh's expertise in functional genomics has been recognized as he has been frequently invited as speaker at international conferences and participating in national roundtable discussions. He also conducted various seminars and workshops. Other than that, Dr. Goh was a visiting researcher at National Institute of Genetics, NIG, Japan in 2018. With that introduction, without further ado, let us invite Gohan to share on the topic, Advancement and Trends in NGS from Genomics to Precision Biotechnology. Please welcome. Okay, thank you, Nordiana. Everyone can hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, thanks for the kind introductions. And for the 45 minutes or so, I'm going to like talk, share with you about NGS. Everyone can see the screen, right? Yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. Okay. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my camera because I'm using mobile hotspot filtering <laughs> just to save some bandwidth. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll just share the screen. Thank you everyone for joining this morning. So today, share a bit on the background on the NGS, the latest advancement and the current trends. So uh, I'll break it down into different uh, sections. First is mainly uh, on the next generation sequencing to bring everyone on the same level on the what it mean by NGS. Then I'll put into the context of genomics research uh, and then introduce some of the application and the trends and then the future prospect for you all. Okay, if the time permit, I'm just going to briefly go through some of the research uh, that we use the NGS at Inbiosis. Next generation sequencing, also known as the high throughput sequencing. If you look at this, it's a good analogy. Um, why it's called the next generation sequencing? Because there's a first generation. So the next generation is like the one that's substituting the first generation, which is a single sequencing. I can see the water trickling down, that is like representing the throughput. That's very take long time and it's only generating very few. For those that are senior enough in the audience, you will realize that single sequencing is like, um, compared to the high throughput sequencing, you have millions of reads. Whereas the single sequencing, you just 10 to hundreds in the past. So the next generation sequencing also represents the third generation, which some people call next next generation. So the, the difference between second generation and third generation is in terms of their sequencing. One is massively parallel, the other one is single molecule. You can see the amount of data generated is getting more and more. Okay, so uh, for the development of which is a single sequencing, that generate read about 1 to 2 kb. There's a long time, long lag time for it from the invention of PCR in the 70s until the launch of the FBI 3730XL, which is the more common single sequencing, still applicable nowadays. It's the, still the golden standard. So the, the gold standard of sequencing is still go through single sequencing. That's why for those doing cloning, you still send for single sequencing for verification. But I'm not sure in the future, 
For now, single sequencing still not obsolete, still in place. Then we have the second generation, also known as the sorry, short read sequencing. And you can see all the blue uh, section here. The short read sequencing started with the um, actually started with Solexa, which is acquired by Illumina. Nowadays, you only heard Illumina because Illumina bought over Solexa. So this is what it, because it's generally generating only 50 to 450 base pair, shorter than the single sequencing. And the most common one is like the 454, Ion Torrent, Illumina, and Solid. But then 454 has gone obsolete. Uh, Solid also no one used ready. And then we have the third generation, which generate over 10 kilo base and can be up to 800 kilo base. And recently, the latest, I think, is the PEC Bio SQL 2, uh, generated uh, by, uh, produced by PEC Bio. Okay. So the different sequencer come with different kind of sequencing chemistry. Synthesis, the most common one, that's uh, on the cluster flow cell. Then you have this sequencing by ligation in the solid system that depend on the decoding of the uh, four uh, adapter. Four, four ad it's based on the four nucleotide adapter. Then we have the emulsion base 454 that's no longer in place. Then we have the ion torrent based on the proton release and general and another board. If you are interested, you can watch the YouTube. I'm not going into details for this. And that based on different detection chemistry, two of them use the electric current detections, but mostly based on fluorescent. And this is throughput. And there are many different machines, even from the same Illumina, there are different models to cater for different scale, either in a production scale, like a sequencing service provider, like BGI. They need a high throughput machine. Then you have the uh, lab base bench top also you can nanopore. How many can you see in this slide? Can you can you try to count? How many sequencer can you see? This picture was taken like six or seven years ago in a Norwegian sequencing center. You can see the pack bio sequencer, you can see the Illumina high seek and also the C bot to generate the cluster before sequencing. Then you have this single sequencer, you have the Roche 454, you have the Ion Proton, and you also have the Ion PGM. Okay, but however, a lot of these machines no longer provide is the NovaSeq, NextSeq, and MySeq for Illumina. Then they also provide single cell sequencing using the 10X genomic chromium. The tech bio already come to SQL2 system and then the min ion. Nowadays, is miniaturization. So you can even sequencing from home. Like nowadays, so many people working from home, you can also do sequencing at home. You can see this, this is the mean ion. This so small only here. And this picture is by uh, Dr. Gan from the GeneSeq. And even on the, on, when he's driving, so in the car. So in the future, you, you will envision that it's going to be smaller and smaller and become a handheld. So this is the latest. I don't think it's yet to launch. And it's Cosmic Ion. You can plug into your phone. So later you can sequence in your phone mobile devices. And there's the apps that come with it. The apps are already available to, to download and run to control the Min Ion. But this Min Ion that plug in, uh, I think not yet in the market. Okay. So what are the applications? So and the RNA sequencing. So the DNA sequencing allows you to look into the DNA. The whole genome sequencing is the most common one. Then you can even check the DNA modification and look at the chromosome uh, operation. Then you have the chromatin immunopresentation to look at other genetic marks yeah, or find the DNA binding. So this is incorporated with other omics, not just the NGS sequencing. Then you have the transcriptome rna seq to look at the gene expression level, the mutation, second structure, following is more like the translatome. You can look at what transcript is actually being translated into protein. Instead of those floating around in the cytoplasm, 
this is targeted to those transcripts that are actually actively being translated into protein. So it's also known as translatome. So for transcriptome, which is my specialization, you can do a lot of things from it. So it's more on the functional side of it. So now look at the um, and just actually it's go hand in hand with the genomic research. Um, a different generation sequencing and you have the milestone of the uh, uh, human genome project which is before even NGS so the human genome project was all based on single sequencing so what is genomic there are some milestones you can guess why is it first is the genetic the element of genetic Mendel genetics that is rediscovered in 1900 then the discovery of the DNA sequence based on the Rosaline x-ray diffraction then the invention of the PCR. After this, then followed by the single sequencing, the chain termination sequencing. Then you have the human genome project starting 1990s, that lasted around like 13 years. Then you have the synthetic genome. Then you have the CRISPR genome editing technology. So what's next? So you might be wonder. What, what is coming in the 2021? The times go so fast and everything develops so fast. So currently, we kept on the uh, milestone just now. The human genome project, even though it's stated as completed in 2003, however, the, 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 the sequencing is still ongoing. Even until today, it's not yet completed. The latest publication is the 4th of June this year and the genome version of T2T, which is a consortium, CHM13, sequence at 200 megabase with additional 115 genes. But the Y chromosome is yet to be completed. You can see that even though the, the project started in 1990s, even until today, we not yet get the full sequences due to the many dark, uh, dark matters, so to speak, in the genome. So you can see, uh, people are still working hard in sequencing the complete genome, ta tackling those regions that is hard to reach, like the centromere and then the telomere area, the ends and the middle, the dense region. So um, you can see there's a sharp increase here due to the large, uh, the single molecule sequencing. Okay. So I'll. Um, so what come with the sequencing is the post-genomic era. We are now living in a post-genomic big data era. There are other areas that generate big data and biology is one of them, especially towards the personal health, personal uh, life, medicine. You can have all these different data generated. However, it's not so common yet in Malaysia. The trend I'm talking about here is the global trend in the two generated for individual for clinical application, which we are going through uh, nowadays. So if you are thinking about the future, your future job prospect, you have to think this way, the big data, the biological big data. So the, this result in biological data explosion exponentially increased. So you have to start thinking about how then in the future people are going to store the data, access the data, manage the data, analyze the data. So that is the current uh, challenge. So now we are reading the DNA. In the future, we might be using it to store the data instead. So it can, as you can see, the, 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 the information can be stored by DNA is so much greater than the per weight density. You see one gram, of the DNA can actually store 200 petabytes. How many hard disks already? The one hard disk weight how much? Imagine the amount of the DNA to, to the weight of your hard disk can store how much information. However, this requires fast decoding. So in the future, DNA sequencing might be just so fast, just a blink of an eye then can sequence very fast. We don't know. So that is a possibility that DNA can be a long-term storage because even ancient DNA, you can still get the DNA sequence. So this is how 
great is how stable is DNA for long-term storage. You can imagine using DNA for an archiving for many important information data storage. The study of whole genomes, that's what you think of. But however, it can be split into different aspects like the structural genomic, computational genomic, and functional genomic. What we mean by what people think of genomic is mainly just the genome blueprint. Okay, this is like some of the example from uh, some of the crop, uh, some uh, legume crops here from the plant. So you can see a lot of this kind of circles, uh, visualization of all the sequence information in the different chromosome. But there are more to it. In terms of structure, you make there are two definitions. One is uh, the, the or logi. So you can see all this, or it can be the comparative. Uh, study like the Sinteni, you can see this, the mouse, how the location of the genes in the chromosome of human. So this is like the color, um, the, 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 the genes map to the human chromosome. So this is one way of people studying structural genomics. Another definition of structural genomics is the, uh, to try to get to all the protein structures and code protein structural uh, genomics. And then you have the function genomic, which I am very much interested in, uh, on the transcriptomic and the proteomic, which is the express functional side of the genome. Genome is just a blueprint. What makes the cell function is actually the protein generated from the transcript being transcribed from the genome. And the ultimate manifest of the protein, uh, the cell activity is the proteins and also the metabolite generated. And this is also considered genomics. See, genomics is very broad. It's beyond just the genome. So, and it covers across many different fields, from fundamental to applied until the field. Okay. So you have the translational genomics for the field application. Now we are going to look at the, some of the application. So there are mainly five, and this is mostly uh, human-centric in a way because they deal with genomic medicine. However, the disease genomic also deal with the plant disease, also the microbe, pathogen, everything. So you can think about that. Genomic is everything living. Uh, getting the drug. So disease genomic trying to understand the mechanism, what's causing the disease. And pharmacogenomic trying to get to the drug that works. Then you have the genomic medicine for the diagnostic and the therapy. Uh, to look at what is causal of the, uh, the, 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 the disease. And then you can have the genome editing for functional analysis of the test. You can have the, like the COVID-19 um, diagnostic kit using the CRISPR-Cas genome, totally reinvent the whole, uh, whole, whole field. So more on the synthetic genomics, it's different compared to genome engineering in the sense that it's introduced a long stretch of synthetic DNA instead of editing just small stretches of genomic DNA. So there are a lot of advancement in this field and the latest is this uh, synthetic, totally synthetic genome, Caulobacter etensis 2.0, computerly assisted de novo chemically synthesized genome, which is minimal, just essential genome that make it alive. And it, in the future, you can generate artificial cells and this cross over different kingdom. Okay. So now we go to some of the trends. There are top 10 that I can think of. This is based on my personal opinion, so it's not the whole truth. But I want to introduce to you uh, what are some of these, uh, what's happening in the genomics and how it's relevant. Because mainly all of this involves NGS. So it's fit into today's topic on the NGS. All, all this uses NGS in the uh, study. So metagenomics, also known as the genomic of the environment, is basically any sample from anywhere. But the most common is the microbiome because for clinical uses, you can see hundreds of publication, thousands of publications studying the microbiome as we in our guts. And then there are also people studying the from the soil and from the seawater and whatever you can think of 
just you can sequence them nowadays. Okay, so it it can be sequence or function based approach, and the road to metagenomics started from the microbiology. Until now, the sequencer with increasing number of uh, throughput. So they can be targeted or untargeted. Some of you might be familiar. Targeted is basically focused on the amplicon on the targeted sequences. And to identify what, what is there, what, what's, what organism is there, what microbe is present, what virus is present. So in here, the cDNA and the DNA, so without amplification, uh, you can also go through untargeted and targeted from this uh, downward. So it can be from RNA or DNA. So you can have the meta transcriptomics or meta protomics. So you can, so genomic in this sense, not just the genes, but also protein, also the transcript. So the, from the two line here, all converge to the analysis on the distribution of the, um, the organism or, or the microbes, and then the taxonomic uh, distribution. So both of these involve interpretation of function. Um, the, 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 the presence of certain domain or the bacterial in the sample representation if it's pathogenic, then you would expect it to have some uh, negative effect, or it can be some uh, probiotic micro, for example, in the gut, then you will, you will expect it to be a good one. So people tend to interpret the functions of uh, micro based on the species identified from metagenome study. So how this has evolved? So in the past, it's all research oriented. Now, actually, the field moved into the clinical application. Since the sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper, now the clinic can also use it for diagnostic. So you can apply this at the clinical setting. And this is kind of an example from the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can use it to study the resistance to antiviral drug, to check the viral genotyping uh, and tracking of viral infection, some of the antibiotic resistant genes, and also for the pathogens detection. So there are many applications now in the clinical setting based on metagenomics. Okay, and this move on to the evolutionary genomics. So it's related to metagenomics in a way, but it's targeted to like the most common one is the, the SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19. The first uh, publication, so to speak, that uses the public data to study the origins of the COVID-19. So the evolutionary genomics allowed us to trace the origin, to survey the, the population, to identify the transmission route, track the mutation, the evolutionary rates, and they design and evaluate the diagnostic test. That is what you are dealing with daily, right? You can see the Delta variants, all these variant variants, because people go and sequence this virus. And now with the fast you can just sequence the virus and get the full length sequence for the geno phylogenomic comparison okay and this process is still ongoing because the virus keep mutating and beyond just uh, the COVID-19 actually there are already ongoing biosurveillance project in the global there are some of the famous ones like the international barcode of life bioscan the earth Bi biogenome project and then you have the global viral projects there are so many sequencing, the global sequencing project ongoing at the moment by consortium. It's not by a single lab, but. And this allowed phylogenomics. For example, this study uses 10,000 genome to, to construct this phylo, phylogenomic information at the domain level uh, uh, relationship. And they show a closer evolutionary proximity between archaea and bacteria. Because in the past, they don't use the full genome. No, now they use the full genome, they can see a closer relationship. Okay. So further the, from that is a population genomics. It allows you to survey the patterns and then the within and among solution. So it's related with the evolution genomics just now. And this uses the uh, Bayesian uh, statistic for, to check the 
any population differentiation. So this is more for those that's interested in molecular ecology. And a good example is this malaria uh, causing uh, mosquito, Anopheles gambiae. So this can be used to identify the uh, certain uh, low size that is under selection for its uh, survival. So this can allow us to understand the evolutionary process of affecting genome and trends to a global level population genomic nowadays. So getting harder and harder to get into publication, the high population genomic is the population resequencing. Once we get the reference, it's not enough. Just like once we get a human reference, there are so many different people with different variations. So you have to do a lot of resequencing. Resequencing is slightly different from the whole genome sequencing. So you can have a lower coverage. However, nowadays, since it's very cheap, people still use the whole genome coverage, uh, whole genome sequencing approach for the resequencing. In this case, is an example on bitter gourd. They study the different uh, fruit traits and then the genetic architecture to look at the demographic history of domestication and then look at the pattern of selections. So what this means? When you have a lot of different varieties, for example, this not just apply to the vegetables, uh, crop, but also poultry. Like for example, chicken, all the uh, different uh, uh, beef, and all the, all the meat that we generated, the, 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 the origin of it, people can do sequencing for functional genomics or genome editing and either to use it for cross-breeding, the genomic assisted breeding or for genome editing. So if one is targeted, the other is the natural way, more acceptable. And then this also led on to the number four, the pan genomic. Some of you never heard, some of you might heard. Pan genomic basically is like a, a genome reference that cover all the different variations from different cultivars of the same species. So these are different individuals. So some of them have some variation, but some are highly conserved between them. And that's what we call the core genome. Whereas those that are different between the people or individual people. Pan genome just put in everything from, from everyone. So this allowed uh, us to capture the global and population variation and try to link the phenotype to the causal variant. The few, for, uh, some of, uh, good example is this, uh, last year publication on the tomato pan structural variant genome. So structural variant is more on the regulation element of the gene, not the gene itself, but the regulatory element, the cis regulatory structural variant actually control for a lot of traits like the flavor, fruit size, and productivity of the tomato. The either it's going to branch like this. So all this depends on the uh, cis regulatory element, which is amazing that you wouldn't discover just simply from uh, the previous study without comparing the different accession. So this is a uh, a, a big project that create a very insightful uh, information about tomato. So that is just from the species. And then you can combine all these different species. So just now we are talking about a species. Now you're talking about a whole genus. If you combine all from different species, you can create a super pan genomics for the whole genus. Okay, then you can represent the maximum diversity of the genus. Then we move on to the genome-wide association study. Uh, I use a human, for example, but this is also applicable to any micro. Uh, it is usually uh, uh, used to compare the genotype of large number of genes from large number of cases of phenotype we control subject and looking for the variant, also known as a polymorphism. So a uh, good uh, common one is like the determining the risk in the genomic medicine. So to identify polymorphism, for example, the BRCA genes for the breast and ovarian cancer. The first ever GWAS is actually like 16 years ago on the age-related macular degeneration, the one that going blind when you are uh, aging causes the uh, aging causes uh, the 
is actually revolutionized the genomic medicine when it started. And a lot of cancer study use the GWAS to link the variant trait. And also nowadays switching to whole genome sequencing. Last time we use a SNP arrays, which is like a, a chip to study the, uh, the, the, the variants. So SNP is like the single nucleotide polymorphism. More on the GWAS, so far there are, un until 2018, there are over 3,600 3, GWAS study on 3,508 traits. And the sample size is growing and growing and see the, the, the exponential curve. And then the ancestry is also changing. There are more of other ancestry, but still dominated by the European, simply because the study is based on European population. And these are some of the highly cited GWAS study. So what the future hold for GWAS? Uh, European still dominating. However, you can see the other population is growing as the technology is transferred to other countries. So, and this is what has been done and this is what will be coming in the future. The people go from more diverse ethnic group with the larger, more uh, reference panels. Okay, so we we'll see more of this coming and also the meta analysis, which is the analysis of all the GWA study. For example, in the tomato flavor, people analyze the uh, GWA studies in tomato to analyze, to, to come to the uh, general consensus, what is not. There can be more than one GWA study on the same topic. When you combine all the, the statistical power will be stronger. To, to identify whether this is truly the case or not for the certain loci or the genes that involve or are responsible for the polymorphism. Then number six, we have the single cell omics. Why I use omics? Because now you can do single cell genomic, single cell transcriptomic, single cell proteomic, and even single cell metabolomic is on in the pipeline. And you can, and mission in the future, who knows, you can straight away do all this in one run. So you can straight away get the DNA, the, the RNA, the protein from this single cell pipeline and straight away get all these different omics. I'll come to why we need these all different omics in the later. Okay. So however single cell you require use to split up the cell, the tissue and then do some flow cytometry of the cell sorting to get to the individual cell. And one, the reason published one is a single cell transcomic atlas in the mouse. The, it's known as a mouse aging cell atlas. So this is also another blueprint for the organism based on check, uh, allow you to know the gene expression changes for further advanced study. And the trends is going to uh, different techniques to study the different part. So the dynamic on the spatial position, even on the protein state, uh, want to know about the epigenome of individual cells. And mostly people use it for cancer study because cancer is heterogeneous. People want to go into high resolution, then they want the single cell genomics for this cancer study. So even for the MRI alone, there are so many different techniques for different purpose. And now from single cell, you can go into in situ sequencing. This is like published this year. You can get into, this is like the nucleus from a single, uh, from a single cell. You can even sequence the individual spatial localized of the genome region. That's how high the resolution now. It's going deeper and deeper and higher and higher the resolution. Uh, I think, sorry about that. I, yeah, I, spatial genome organization, uh, yes, at the single nucleus. Okay. So we move on to the next one. 
The oncogenomic, onco stands for cancer. So cancer genome is a big field, large field, and it, there's a lot of country doing their population study on the different cancer. And this is what we can learn about on, from oncogenomic. So what is the driver landscape? How to classify them based on molecular and histological analysis? Then the study the mechanism of it so that we can get the drugs that can target those mechanisms. And what are the genome basis of metastasis to prevent it from spreading to other parts of the body? And the field is going into the pan cancer atlas. You can from different tissues from this public database. So you can even run a research without doing your sequencing, the sequencing yourself. There are so many data out there. It's just you asking the right question that no one has asked yet and come up with the analysis or a novel way of uh, interpreting it, then you can get something meaningful out from it. Just like the network analysis of the COVID-19, the virus. The, the research group don't use any of their own sequencing. They just use the public data and then they can get into a very high impact simply because of the analysis and it's come in a timely manner. Who, whoever can come up with the result first, they get to publish first. That is the harsh reality of science. So you have to be fast and be the first person to have the idea to get published. Okay, so now it's the, the, the oncogenomics also going to multi-omics to establish the pencil, pen cancer atlas and it's a large scale and global population study. In terms of structural genomics, as I mentioned from the beginning, uh, it's going to mapping 3D chromosome architecture. You can see the resolution. This is at the DNA double helix level, and then you go zoom out and zoom out until you get a histone, and then the chromosome packing. Then you have this chromatin, and then how it, 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 the resolution is increasing like, like this. And you have different sequencing uh, approach for that at different levels. So you can do multi scale exploration based on different type of uh, sequencing. This is also one of the NGS. So uh, now we go to the C world. So this is how it evolved for the structural genomics. And can see what people ask, why you want to study the structural genomics and like the, how the, the chromosome is packed? Because it has implications to disease development. For example, this comparing the healthy cell with the cancer cell at the larger level. So this is the larger scale level. They're actually very similar. However, when you zoom down to the chromatin loop level, there's actually difference between the cancer cell and then the healthy cell. So this aspect can be targeted for the drug. There's a, actually a drug that can target this kind of um, aberration. So you have the potential to be a target for the drug, cancer drug. So why we need multi-omics? And we go down the different omics, you can see the increasing complexity and the less we understand, NGS mainly targeting this aspect so we can sequence this. However, there are so much more that happen that define the molecular function that we don't know just simply from NGS. Hence, we need to incorporate with other omics like the translatome, the study the proteomics, including a post-translational modification, how the protein is uh, modified. Then studying the network of the protein-protein interaction to have a come to a closer reality of what is actually happening to the cell or the organism. And this leads on to the network analysis or system integrations. So we have this different omic. You need the computer integration in the network and the statistic to try to make sense of it. So this uh, have been developed and there are many around the, uh, the omics data analysis. And multi-omics, also known as the pan-omics. So the, the, the field is like doing more and more different omics and try to integrate them together nowadays. So you can see it's an example for the human study. And there are various levels you can integrate the multi-omics, either at the correlation level, for example, expression of genes and expression of protein, are they correlated? Then you have the multivariate analysis or cluster analysis to see how the sample or gene cluster between the different type of sample, the control, healthy, or whatever, treated sample. Then you can integrate at the level two, the pathway, you can map the genes or the, uh, the one that's perturbed, per, perturbed 
either gene or protein on a pathway and also look at their core expression or you can perform the mathematical modeling to look at the dynamic of it and perform some genome scale analysis. Lastly, artificial intelligence based on machine and deep, deep learning uh, with the computer vision for the classification, segmentation, image retrieval, or even the natural language processing uh, from the literature. So you need computer now to do some literature analysis for you. There are so many papers out there. There's so many papers coming up. So this artificial intelligence can help with getting meaningful knowledge out from all these publications. And deep neural network can be used for recognition, relation extraction, also information retrieval. So these are some of the example that, that's related to NGS. And the most, uh, uh, the most uh, famous one nowadays, the AlphaFold 2, the recently beat uh, human for the best prediction of the structural protein model. And just to quote the latest uh, opinion of the biotech researcher from the Prof. Rajiv Vashini, uh, you can see there are massive amount of sequence data coming up and he's a plant biologist. So um, then you, you will expect to be uh, using more of the artificial intelligence and machine learning. So for you to get ahead in this field, then you have to equip yourself with such knowledge or exposure to this kind of area of research. So just to sum up the trends, the top 10 that I have selected, this is how they evolve from metagenomic to clinical metagenomics, evolution genomic to phylogenomics, population genomic to resequencing, pangenomic or super pangenome, and then the meta GWAS, single cell omics to institute omics or the fluorescent institute sequencing. Oncology is pan cancer, multi omic atlas, and then structural omic, the high C sequencing is still ongoing for people studying, and they are evolving more and more of artificial intelligence. So uh, I'm not, not going to read out, I'm just going to show you this. It's the summary of this part. Okay, so um, what this hold for you all? The genomic market is on the rise. There's Singapore, you can see, and then Japan. I, unfortunately, I don't have the statistic for Malaysia. But globally, you have to think global. Don't just restrict yourself to Malaysian opportunity. You can migrate or you can work globally. Uh, there are global market of 31.1 billion expected by 2027. And it's still on the rise. It's mainly on the function genomic. Uh, etc. Okay, and because the clinical genomic is all driven by translational to the consumer, the research had to be translated into application, and this is what driving the economy. With the price of sequencing going down and lower and lower, in the future everyone can have their genome sequence. Now you already have had the DNA test, the cert DNA. Some of you might have seen that in your Facebook advertisement. <laughs> for the genetic testing. That is not whole genome sequencing. However, it's still one of the way that people can check the genetic variant from the targeted, uh, from the exome sequencing or whatever that's being done. Or it's just a SNP array. So this fast growing is due to the, uh, the, at the, the lowering cost and also the automated analysis pipeline. So everything will be automated. You just put in a sample in the past. In the future, they will come out the report generated. That's the, 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 the pipeline requires you all or someone to, to program. So you need a lot of programmer or analytics in the future. And this global artificial intelligence in the genomic market is inevitable. It's the, the, the trend now. And how you apply, for example, uh, you have the biologists performing the experiment, then you have the AI data scientists for the models, and then it's a, this can be useful for the diagnostic of pharmacogenesis on the patient genomes to identify the risk, and then use a machine learning approach to, uh, to continue improving these models. So, as a next generation biologist, like now you have the next generation sequencing by 
when you keep saying next generation as though it's going to be the future, however, is it now? Just like this minimal skill set, this article was published in 2017, but this is what required of you now. However, in Malaysia, not all students have this skill, not covered by syllabus even. You have to learn it yourself at your free time. Just like when you play game, computer game, on the mobile game, instead of using the time to play mobile game, you could use it to learn data science on your mobile phone. Okay, everything is self-learned nowadays with the computer programming. And you can, if you are keen on this field, you can even go into this data science. It, it involves a lot of thinking, problem solving, and programming skills. So for those that are interested in this, can pursue this because they are in high demand. Especially those with solid biology background and also computation analytical skills. So this is fresh from the oven. This, this week just announced about the national 4IR policy, how NGS applied. Okay, so the pre-existing technology you have here already, all these are related to NGS. So com cloud computing, genetic engineering, supercomputing, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, biology, like I mentioned. And in the future, the DNA data storage also uh, that I mentioned in the beginning, and then you have the genetic computing, which is in line with the quantum computing. Not sure. So the the the, the field that we might go into are this like the bio uh, technology, uh, the supercomputing or artificial intelligence, and this all based on the science, technology, innovation, economy ecosystem. Okay, so you can read up more on this, how you apply. Okay, and it's still applicable for education, agriculture, health service, and environmental service. So I believe you all are biomedic students. You should apply your skill, not just in biology. Just think about whatever field that you can contribute to. And in this convergent era of the physical, biological big data, how NGS can apply, actually all are related. NGS actually com combine the digital biology, just that towards the physical is harder, okay? But we'll see how it combines. So to sum up my talk and the title today, so from genomics to precision biotechnology, how this works. So you have this GWA study, they're going to meta, and they have high throughput phenotyping, which doesn't use NGS, but a lot of imaging technology. But you have the high throughput genotyping and functional genomics that use a lot of NGS. All this contribute to molecular or genomic assisted breeding or the gene genome editing that contribute to precision medicine and agriculture. So the biotechnology is not restricted to just human and plant, but also to the micro, the industrial level. So for genome engineering, microbial engineering, all this synthetic biology also are helped by this precision biotechnology. And how this related with the 4IR, you can see the high throughput phenotyping require this internet of things, the drones, the imaging and machine learning. High throughput genotyping will use the robotic and automation in the future. Then this all linked to this 4IR. So you try to relate yourself so that you are not obsolete. You can still change field, all of us are still young, so I can still change field if I want. <laughs> okay, just continuous learn. So to sum up, everything, the data is increasing towards storage and cloud computing. The wet lab will go into automation, AI and machine learning. So this all lead to the precision medicine and we need the integrative healthcare with the expanding global market. Then you all are the new generation of biologists that need to be uh, familiar with the computing analytics side. The security of this data actually has to be looked into and the blockchain technology is relevant for this data ownership on your own personal data. And this molecule may certainly on to the issue on the bioethics. And this is Bioethic 2.0, you can look up and read about it. So a lot of uh, things about like genome editing, the ethical issues and things like that, and the have and have not, the, the, the gap between the people. So how we deal with it and how this, the fourth industrial revolution will define the future. That's for us to look into in the future. I think uh, it's good time for me to end the session. I think the topic now, because I still have the last part. For you, for the latest, sorry, uh, 
for you to stay up to date with the latest breakthrough, you cannot just rely on the textbook. You have to, you have to go to the latest literature. So familiar yourself with the latest literature from this publication, Nature Science, which is weekly, and then all this. If you want to know more about the genomic breakthrough, it won't be in the textbook yet because it's happened so fast. If you want to really be cutting edge, then you have to read up all this yourself on the topic that you are interested in. Or follow something of interest in the social media. Some news are for you. More layman term is easier to follow. Okay. I think that's all from me. I'll just I'll stop share. Okay. Thank you. Is it good Sushi. time? Is it good time for me to Thank stop? Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Gohohan, for the very informative sharing. Hopefully, our precious listeners did not miss any single point from this session. Okay, so next we will proceed with the Q&A session. So to fellow audience, if you have any questions regarding this session, you are welcome to ask the speaker now. You may unmute your microphone or drop your questions in the chat box. Uh, a very good morning, doctor. Um, can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, doctor, for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask, what are the current um, applications of NGS in Malaysia currently? Like what are the main applications inside Malaysia at this moment? At this moment, there'll be a lot of COVID-19 virus sequencing. You can ask Dr. Gan, he did a lot of COVID-19 virus sequencing using his nanopore. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a lot of uh, the genome sequence, especially in the micro, uh, the microbial side, a lot of genome sequencing using the nanopore because it's very simple compared to the complex plant genome or eukaryotic genome. So that, uh, I think there's a lot. But for my group, I'm dealing with plant and uh, a lot more on plants. So I, I do only like transcriptomics. The most for the genomic was for the mangosteen, but it's uh, too complex and the coverage is not high enough. We cannot get the high quality assembly. Uh, but we're still working on that. So, but for the microbial side of the sequencing, I think it's more feasible. So in Malaysia, you think about the NGS application, there's a lot for the microbial study because it's uh, more convenient and everything is more established. The pipeline is all there. People just simply send oh, another thing. In Malaysia, nowadays people don't do their sequencing themselves. Most of them send for supplier and and they sent out overseas for the sequencing service provider to do all those uh, sequencing. Even though you no need to do the sequencing yourself, you should know and understand about the sequencing platform, their caveat, their limitation, or whatever bias there might be uh, resulting from that. Also, it's good to understand about the, how it's being analyzed by the provider. So, yeah. So to put it simply, a lot of microbial studies on in NGS application for gene discovery because Malaysia is full of biodiversity, there are so many microbes not yet even discovered. People are trying to discover those things from the NGS. Yes, I hope they understand, uh, 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 answer your questions. Okay, thank you, doctor. And okay, there's doctor, a question so on the chat question. box. Yes, on the chat. Yeah, what is the major problem in implementing AI by using NGS? Since the relevant accuracy is one of the most important factors to represent reality. Uh, this is by Anis Shaswina. So um, that's, the, that's the magic about AI. AI can identify noise. So as you say, the accuracy is the, one of the important factors. Accuracy in this case is the sequencing accuracy, do you mean? Uh, if it's on the sequencing accuracy, that's not a problem for Illumina. And even for the nano pore nowadays, accuracy is ever increasing. So even though the platform, there's the new, no new mean ion, but there's a chemistry and the pore technology all are increasing in accuracy. So accuracy, it might be slight in accuracy. However, it's not a big issue. And what AI is useful is to filter out all this noise. So um, 
uh, the major problem to implement AI is actually uh, the major challenge is find the uh, the context why you want to apply the AI. You're getting the idea of what the use of AI, not the AI itself. AI itself is ever developing. It's a field itself. It's a big field like biology. AI is, is on its own is a field and it's very advanced. How you cross between the AI to the biology, that is the issue. Uh, that's the challenge. Like what in what context of biology you want to use it for? But uh, in terms of accuracy, it's not a, an issue because even AI can use to like uh, with the machine learning can kind of like know what is wrong and what is correct. Uh, that is can be one of the application. Okay. And the next question is what may be the other achievement that we are expecting through NGS in the near future? Uh, we referring to Malaysia or we referring to the world in general? So I'll answer in the two aspects. Uh, in Malaysia, um, what we are expecting through NGS? So far, Malaysia is still behind the world for NGS simply because uh, the cost and the funding. And in terms of the world, uh, the other achievement, uh, as I mentioned just now, is everything going to the in-situ. So you can now have a spatial sequencing. So spatial sequencing is not applicable for nanopore. Nanopore needs to be extracted. But the in-situ sequencing requires a machine that you have to have this, uh, the, 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 you have to place the, 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 the tissue or the sections of the tissue into the machine. So it's not applicable for nanopore. You must understand the different sequencing technology is not one size fits all. They have been developed for different applications. For example, for gene expression study, nanopore and PEC bio is not superior than Illumina. Illumina is more preferred for expression study. So it depends on the application. The next achievement will be like I showed just now the in-situ NGS or the in-situ sequencing. Yes. Okay. Um, the next question from Noranzrian. Can random targeted gene sequence be used to predict newer variants of viruses and diseases? And can it be used to design multiple specific vaccines and respective treatment? The second part of the question is definitely can. You can use CRISPR to target multiple genes with a different single guide RNA or DNA. Then the random targeted gene sequence, uh, how random is random? If you want to use it to predict a certain variant of virus, there needs to be a context. You cannot just simply go and get the sample and sequence it. The funder won't allow that. And I don't think you have the money to do so. <laughs> so you have to have a meaning to what sample you choose to sequence. Okay. The next question by Siti No Aslia. How accurate is the portable technology used in analyzing NGS? And how long does this technology take to be used widely? Uh, how long? What do I mean, how long does it take this to be used by? It's already used widely. Nanopore, like Dr. Gan, use it at home. <laughs> you can do sequencing at home. However, were you willing to pay like 4,000 ringgit? That, that one piece of USB device called around 4,000 ringgit. So you can run only once and have to replace the consumable inside the pore. And all depend on how good is your quality and how you load it. If you accidentally poke it, then 4,000 is gone. <laughs> so you have to be very careful. So the, 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 the trend is towards the technology that is more resilient or robust, that even uh, uh, not so good quality RNA or DNA can be sequenced. And how accurate is the portable technology? Uh, it's as accurate as usable. Because um, if you sequence a lot of it, for example, you have the virus and, and the nanopore can see sequence million of reads. You By combining the million of reads, you actually cancel out the random accuracy. You might have a, a wrong base at one or two, one or two by, by chance. But then if you have million of reads combined together from the same sample, you get the accurate read. Did you get that? So, um, uh, in top Illumina, that even less because it's very high accuracy nowadays. Illumina really very uh, well established, whereas the nanopore is on the rise. 
And nanopore is not just sequencing DNA, they are developing it to sequence protein directly. <laughs> they want to sequence protein using the pore. It's basically running a molecule through the pores, and then you can read up the amino acid sequence. Imagine that, that would be the next breakthrough. Reading protein. <laughs> Instead of reading nucleotide, you can read other things with the pore, ah, actually. Okay. But then that depends on what application you're looking at. Any more questions? Another thing is, is uh, uh, yes, sorry. No, no, continue. <laughs> okay, so um, the, the device, as you can see, is now can plug and play. <laughs> I show you the Smith Ion. So you can actually plug into your mobile device and it's actually sequencing with in, in real life, live sequencing. So in the future, you go to a clinic, you get a drop of blood, and then in one hour, you get the whole genome and you can get your personalized medicine report all in within like a few hours. You can envision a future like that. Everything automated. Even the sample preparation could be automated in a single cell capillary cell, <laughs> a flow cell. They will put a drop of blood and get the DNA out at the end and then input into the sequencer. And then the sequencing run in real life, real time, and then you get the your genome out, and then straight away know what is the susceptible variant, whether you are susceptible to any cancer, whether this drug work for you or not, and this link up back to the pharmacogenomic again. Then doctor know which drug to prescribe to you, or even there's no need doctor anymore. You at home, you you, you just poke your your finger and then put a drop of blood in the device, and then all everything internet in the cloud. And then the prescription come out automatically by the machine. So doctor will lose their job. <laughs> Scientists will lose their job. <laughs> so you, you, you just need robot in the lab. We don't need you anymore to do culturing. We can use robotic arm to do the extraction, <laughs> the pipetting, everything robotic. <laughs> so what is the purpose? So you have to think about that. Down the line, there's advancement. And then how you can still stay relevant to start thinking about that. The future is now. It is so close now. <laughs> Just that it's happening in other countries first. Malaysia is a bit slow. I think there are one questions in the chat. NGS usually involve, involve many sequencers. How they interpret or analyze the big data uh, by ASMIRU. Uh, we use uh, high performance computing and also cloud computing to combine all this data together. Your laptop can only deal with so small amount of data because the RAM is limited. But I think your computer is like 8 gig of RAM, right? Or your, your mobile phone is like 4 gig of RAM. Or reading sequences is fine. But then if you want to combine hundreds and thousands of genomes together for phylogenomic or comparative genomic, then it will be impossible using your mobile phone or your computer. You need a high computing facility. And the software, the algorithm is moving towards simplifying it to maximize the computing resources. So that you can run hundreds of genomes comparison uh, with the least amount of uh, memory. You know the big uh, computing facility, you have terabyte of RAM. RAM, uh, not storage. <laughs> or petabyte of RAM, random access memory. Your, your, your computer only has 8 gig of RAM or 16 gig of RAM. That one is like 100 or 1,000 fold more powerful than your computer. And then nowadays, people use a lot of graphical processing units. So you use GPU instead of CPU for uh, this kind of processing. So the software had to go hand in hand with the genomic research. And hand big data is also a big deal. Not just in biology, but any, anything. You can go into finance. Finance is the one that deal with big data the most. Every second, how many transactions? Lazada know about your uh, shopping preference for the marketing. <laughs> After you seen that, then the data will offer you another thing that's related. All are this uh, big data. And this is for marketing. It's all customer driven, human driven. Technology is driven by consumers. Okay. And the next question by Aina. Just now, doctor mentioned that NGS in Malaysia is quite left behind. What it takes to fit out the NGS application in Malaysia? Mm, funding. <laughs> and it's no point of getting sequencer in Malaysia. 
the technology got obsolete very fast, like the 454 gone obsolete. And then there's no, no longer use. You can use a machine for four or five years and then a new machine comes. You cannot afford millions of ringgit every time there's a new machine to upgrade. It's not like your mobile phone, you can just upgrade every three years. <laughs> this costs million, million, and you have to justify to the government the return of investment. And unfortunately, a lot of this sequencing don't yield return profit. Unless you provide services. You provide services also, you cannot charge too high because there are a lot of international providers uh, because they run in large scale, they can bring down the cost a lot. Locally, you will run sequencing, it's not cheap. You can ask Dr. Gan. <laughs> it's, cheap, it's more expensive to, 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 to do the NGS in Malaysia compared to other countries where it's more commonplace. Okay, next question. Uh, Ayman, how to make sure the government can allocate more funds on biotech-based IR advancement? How about our current national biotech policy in public and private research center all over Malaysia? Uh, okay, so there are two questions here. How to make sure government can allocate more funds? You have to convince them that this bring money. <laughs> and current budget doesn't allow that. There are more other fields that can bring money. How about current national biotech policy? Uh, the bioeconomy policy is kind of like behind because it ended in 2020. The latest one not yet come out with the national biotech policy 2021 to 2030, not yet out, so we don't know about that. And what happened to the private-private uh, research center? The, the private, the, the public, semi-private, uh, semi-public in a way is the, the, like the ABI, NIBM, the National Institute of Biotechnology, Malaysia. Uh, they are all, we are all struggling with the money. The most expensive is not the machine or the building. The most expensive is the human capital. The salary costs a lot more, just like your GRA, if you are continuing your postgraduate. <laughs> to pay your salary, it costs more than building it. To maintain the facility and to maintain the human capital is the biggest challenge. And, okay. Doctor, I think uh, you can answer Safa's question. Uh, and then we can... Um... Proceed okay. to break. So the last question, uh, send PC sample for NGS, how to analyze the data? What do you mean by, this refer to the microbiome? So you want to send PC sample, you don't just send the PC, you have to extract the sample. So that's your job. <laughs> you have to extract out the RNA or DNA that you want to study, either the metatronchitome or metagenome. Then to analyze the data, you just simply identify what microbe is present and then based on that, refer the function. Or you are doing untargeted approach, you can look at what genes present or expressed by the microbe and look at what genes are active or expressed in the sample. Then to infer the biology. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so you much, want, Dr. Uh, photography yes. session now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, audience, for the questions as well as Dr. Go for answering their queries with a very clear explanations. So next, we will proceed with a photography session. So our audience are very much invited to enable your camera for the photograph session. I hope everyone will turn on their camera. Everyone ready? One, two, three. Okay, one more time. Ready? One, two, three. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Hope you everyone, everyone is motivated to be the next generation biologist. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for your cooperation, everyone. So with that, uh, the first session for our webinar has ended. Now we will have a five minutes break before our second session of the webinar begins. Reminders to all participants again, if you have, who have not yet registered, you may fill in the Google form for attendance through the attached link provided in the chat box. And stay tuned.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move on to the second slide. Before that, I would like to introduce our second speaker for today, Dr. Muhammad Izwan Ismail, a senior lecturer at UITM Mubah Campus. A little bit about his academic background, Dr. Izwan graduated from Diploma in Microbiology at UITM before pursuing his studies in Bachelor of Science in Biomolecular also at UITM. He obtained his PhD from UITM before becoming a senior lecturer at University of Technology Marabung Alam campus by teaching sports education courses for, by one year. Later, he served the Faculty of Applied Sciences in UITM Chawangan Sarawak Muka campus from 2017 until today. Dr. Izwan's latest achievements include Innovation Award for Bacteria as well as target antimicrobial related genes. Besides that, he secured various awards in teaching innovation, focusing on gamification of higher level education. He also received several awards in the innovation of various tools and diagnostic tests, such as drug dosing calculator, paperless assessment trackers, ratio analyzer, and pharmacodiagnostics for precision better for precision medicine. So these are some introductions about Dr. Izwan. Thus, without further ado, let us invite Dr. Muhammad Izwan Ismail to share on the topic, applying whole genome sequencing to study microevolution and antimicrobial resistance. Please welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Miss uh, Moderator. Uh, so can anyone, uh, can everyone hear me just fine? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Give me a second to share my screen. If I can get this to share. I'm not used to using Zoom. It, uh... Okay, so can everyone see the uh, presentation? Yes, Dr. All right. Okay, so uh, hi. Welcome, everyone, uh, to my uh, hopefully very brief talk, although I tend to say that, but it tends to drag on a lot. Uh, so, uh, as the MC has introduced me, my name is uh, uh, Izwan, uh, and I am uh, unimpressively a full graduate of UITM from my diploma, from my pre-diploma diploma degree to my uh, master's, which I've converted to my PhD. Uh, so, um, I know that my background is not very colorful; it's mostly purple, UITM. Uh, but still, I hope that I am able to share some of my experiences with you and give you an idea of how you can use genomics. Uh, to apply for uh, microbial studies, uh, specifically for microevolution and antimicrobial resistance. Okay. Oh, and uh, before I forget, I am currently, as uh, the Ms. MC has explained, uh, servicing UITM uh, Chawangan Muka, uh, Campus Muka in the Sarawak uh, branch. Okay. But I'm currently in KL, Tajiradi. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's move on. Uh, so well, since we're talking about microevolution and antimicrobial resistance, so let's do a bit of an introduction about bacteria. So what exactly is bacteria? But I'm sure you all are familiar with this. Uh, so bacteria are essentially prokaryotic organisms. So you have... So eukaryotes are all of your complex organisms. Prokaryotes are all of your simple organisms, uh, but a bit more complex than viruses. So prokaryotes are your bacteria. So they're present in all environments that are available in uh, on the surfaces, in your body, in clinics, in hospitals, they're everywhere. Okay. All right. So why exactly do we study bacteria? So bacteria are useful for a lot of things. Number one, they are the most common, one of the most common organisms uh, in the world. They're, as I mentioned previously, available everywhere. And this type of the bacteria that we are more commonly familiar with, that we are familiar with, are those that can cause diseases. So those that can cause uh, lung infections, can cause uh, gastrointestinal distress, can cause brain damage and such, those are the ones that we are familiar with. But we also have to keep in mind that we have bacteria that are beneficial to us that we term as probiotics. Okay, so probiotics are very commonly found in your gut microbiome. So this is why we do some of the fe feces sampling that one of the students have asked just now from the presentation by uh, Associate Professor Go. Used to uh, uh, facilitate in our studies to discover new drugs and new therapies to uh, help in, in, in preventing and, and curing diseases. 
And of course, the topic that we are discussing today, uh, the bacteria is a very useful model when it comes to studying evolution, primarily because bacteria have short um, generation times. What it means is they duplicate very quickly compared to us as an organism. So our lifespan can go up until like 100 years, but the bacteria can duplicate every maybe two hours. So every two hours, you'll get a new generation of bacteria. So each generation will have new mutations. And if you have 100 generations within a couple of days, you have 100 potential mutations that you can study. So that's why bacteria is very useful to study evolution. In this context, microevolution. DNA, and we will speak about DNA, we'll have to learn a little bit about the central dogma. Now, since uh, I understand that all of you are bioinformatics students, I assume that you all understand what is central dogma, but just a little bit of an overview. So the central dogma is basically this particular sequence of events. You have your DNA, you have your mRNA, and you have your protein. So the DNA is your blueprint, okay? And the DNA will be transcribed into mRNA. And the mRNA is essentially your messenger that carries information from DNA and then it will then be translated into proteins. So this is the general pipeline when it comes to your blueprint, your DNA, to your protein, which, is, which will express your phenotype, what you can see. So something that you cannot see, the genetic information, to something you can see. So why is it important that we study the central dogma? Because essentially any changes to the DNA will result in changes in the mRNA and then result in changes in the protein. So if you want to study why something appears in a certain way, why certain uh, heritable diseases appear in certain people, you want to take a look at the DNA to study if there's something that's going a bit funky going on in the DNA there. So you take a look at the DNA and you discover why are the proteins or are the phenotypes appearing in such a way. Okay, so that's why we study the central dogma. All right, so we talk about the central dogma. Let's move on to what exactly is a DNA. And again, you're all bioinformatics students and Dr. Uh, Professor Gan Agu has already explained just now, but just, just in case uh, to get everyone on the same level. So DNA are essentially your deoxyribonucleic acids, okay? So that's what it stands for. And why is it important that we study DNA is because the DNA makes up your genes. So the genes is what will express into proteins. Okay, so the genes are units that we can look into to know that they have functions, okay? So we look at DNA to know what exactly is going on with the genes, right? So why exactly do we study DNA or genes? Well, primarily because as a changes in the DNA would result in changes in the phenotype. So changes in the phenotype is something that you want to understand. So we study genes because if we observe novel mutations or novel genes in a particular organism, then we can understand why the organism is behaving that way and how is it passing down that information from generation to generation. Okay, so then we can, we can know a lot of things from there. Okay, so now that we looked at what DNA is, let's briefly look into sequencing. And I, uh, Associate Professor uh, Go just now has explained in very, very concise detail about sequencing. So I'll just touch a little bit on the whole thing, okay? So sequencing is when you have an unknown sequence of DNA, your ATCG, but you don't know what exactly is the appropriate sequence. So you just run that into a sequencer, very easy, unknown. The entire region of that sequence, and then we identify what genes are present in that sequence. So in this case, for example, one long sequence here will have three present genes and there will be markers that determine uh, what the, um, where the genes are exactly, specifically. So this is just a representation. It's not entirely accurate, just so that you get an idea. Okay, so the uses of genetic in genomic information. If let's say in the context of bacteria, you have one parent strain that have split off into two daughter strains, right? Or split off into one daughter strain in this case. So the left side, you have your parent strain, you have your wild type. And on your right side, you have a generation that has broken off and has evolved several mutations. So when we put them side by side, we sequence the genome for the parent and the sequence the genome for the daughter strain. You put them side by side, you can tell that there are differences in the genes of these two uh, organisms. So on the left, the green colored gene, for example, are genes that are unique to the parent, for example. And gene three could be something that the daughter strain has picked up somewhere along the line. It picked up from another organism, okay? And number, uh, gene number four and five, for example, are uh, genes that have mutations. And gene five highlighted here could be mutations that bring about a benefit or a different effect to the 
uh, to the daughter strait. So this is all uncovered through the use of uh, genomic uh, sequencing, essentially. All right. So just keep in mind that sequencing in this context is a tool that we use to study a broader aspect of bacterial uh, microevolution. Okay. So I may be panjang pasal your your genome and DNA and blah blah blah. Uh, before we move on to the details of the application, let's take a little bit uh, a look into the antimicrobial resistance. Right. So what exactly are antimicrobials? So antimicrobials is a broad term. All right. So you have your in this context, you have your antibiotics and you have your antibacterial. So antibiotics, you sure uh, I'm sure you're all are familiar with this by now. Anti meaning anti nya. All right. And then bio meaning life. So antibiotic essentially means any chemicals that can destroy microorganisms. It's the anti-life, antibiotic. But antibacterial, on the other hand, essentially are antibacteria, nyah bacteria, which basically means that they are effective on bacteria. So um, commonly nowadays, people tend to um, use these two terms interchangeably. So when they say antibiotic, they normally refer to antibacterials. But antibiotics can cover broad... Uh, organisms such as your viruses, your parasites, and your bacteria, obviously, but um, antibacterials do not affect other organisms. They only affect bacteria. So when you when you misuse these a antibiotic to treat viruses, for example, it's not going to work because the antibiotic is in fact an antibacterial. So you're killing off bacteria, but you're leaving the viruses alone to be to do their business right but when when that happens the viruses will not have competition in your body so they can wreak havoc without worrying that the bacteria will compete for the nutrients in the body so this is uh, just a, just a brief overview all right so uh, a bit of a breakdown on, on antimicrobials is that you have your surface antimicrobials and you have your very varied antimicrobials. So surface are typically your disinfectants and your antiseptics. And these are things you should not put in your mouth, essentially, okay? Or in your blood. Why would you ever do that? So disinfectants and antiseptics are what you commonly use nowadays. Your, your, your alcohol that you use to, to sanitize your hands, your sanitizers, uh, just to remove uh, bacteria, just to remove viruses from your hands, from surfaces. Uh, other antimicrobials can fall under the category of antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antiparasitic. So these can be topical where you apply uh, uh, oral, where you consume or inject it, okay? So in terms of mechanism of uh, mode of action for these antimicrobials, okay, uh, the uh, antimicrobials will have different targets on the bacteria. So for example, some of them will be able to inhibit protein synthesis. Some of them will be able to uh, break down metabolism and um, interfere with the enzymes in the bacteria. Some of them will have wall, cell wall inhibitor activities where they prevent the bacteria from producing or synthesizing strong enough cell walls, so they break down easily. And some of antibacterials will affect the cell membranes, and some will even uh, target the DNA or RNA, such as your ciprofloxacins, your quinolones, and your rifampin. So different antimicrobials will have different targets and will affect the bacteria differently, okay? And it depends on your gram-positive, gram-negative, or gram-variable bacteria, okay? Uh, so this particular figure, side of action on potential uh, mechanism of bacterial resistance, uh, just, just to give a bit of a highlight that bacteria have different mechanisms to combat the mode of action. So uh, antimicrobials have different actions. Bacteria have uh, different reactions to those antimicrobials to prevent the antimicrobials from taking effect uh, from your efflux pump, from your DX. Too much detail over there. Uh, just a bit of an overview again. Uh, the production of antimicrobials have been slowly declining over the years. Uh, so you, you notice that the different varieties of antimicrobials you have here, the earliest would be your beta-lactams, such as, such as your penicillin, and moving on to your aminoglycosides, chloramphenicol, and blah, 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 blah. So they are varied in chemical structure, they are varied in mode of action, but they do one thing. They kill or they stop bacteria from uh, growing. Okay, so uh, the problem right now is in the year 2000s, discovery of new antimicrobials have been very, shall we say, almost non-existent because it's very expensive to discover new drugs. It's very time-consuming um, time to run all the tests and to try out a lot of, um, 
a lot of simulations and whatnot. So running tests on animal models, for example, could uh, yield results. But when you go into um, human trials, they might not be viable for humans to take. Okay. Uh, so nowadays, people are moving more towards simulations, running protein models, running analysis of protein-protein interactions. But that is for, for, for what you guys are for. You guys are bioinformatics, right? Uh, but even then, I'm sure you all realize the, uh, the, 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 the hardware needed and the software needed to run these analysis. Some of them are very small scale, but others might be a bit broader, bigger scale that might cost a bit more. So uh, pros and cons. So how does anti uh, antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance happens? I'm sure you all are familiar, basically. Uh, when you have a lot of germs, uh, you might have none of them that are antimicrobial resistant. But as you introduce them to low doses of antimicrobials, they will begin to learn. Um, if you, for example, you are given a dose of antibiotics you, when you have a fever, for example, but you don't finish the course of the antibiotics. So you kill, let's say, 99% of the bacteria, but one or two of them survive. And one, of two, one or two of them have learned how to uh, resist the uh, antibiotic that you have taken. Okay, so these two anti, uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria will start to grow and create colonies of their own. And the colonies of the drug resistant bacteria will be the prevalent uh, species within that, that colony. So they will then become drug resistant uh, species within that group. And um, I should probably take note that, you should probably take note that bacteria also have this ability to share plasmids, to share DNA with one another, either share or steal, whichever you prefer. So uh, drug resistant bacteria can hand over uh, resistant traits, resistant genes to non-resistant uh, bacteria, making the non-resistant bacteria resistant so they can share. All right. So now this is just a bit of a cartoon to show that penicillin resistant bacteria can share parts of their genes to non-resistant bacteria and then making them into what we call superbugs, that, uh, bacteria that can resist antimicrobials. And uh, just a bit, another overview, one of the reasons why we have rampant antimicrobial resistance nowadays is because of the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry uh, on the left here. So when we use antibiotics nonchalantly on, on uh, animals, the animals will then uh, carry the antibiotic resistant bacteria in their, in their guts, in their body, in their parts, and this will be transferred to humans. It's a very small case, but it's a significant case, even though small, which will then trans transfer the antimicrobial resistance to the bacteria in our body. And, uh, just to brief reminder that the humans don't become resistant to the bacteria, the bacteria becomes resistant to the anti uh, antimicrobial. Okay, uh, and another method of resistance spreading is through hospitals. So when hospital people, people in hospital get infection, they, what we call as nosocomial infections, they spread that to other people as well. So spreading the antimicrobial resistance even further, okay? Uh, so if you would like to learn a bit more about antibiotics without feeling bored, and then probably listening to me baby all this time might be a bit boring for you. Uh, so you can just look into YouTube. There are plenty of uh, videos nowadays that, nowadays that explain about antibiotics and what we call as the antibiotic apocalypse. So it sounds like fancy, but it's actually a term that scientists use to describe an event where antibiotics no longer work in the world. Uh, if you get an infection, a simple cut, for example, that cut becomes infected, you will not be able to treat the cut. You will have to just rely on your own antibodies. And if your antibodies are not strong enough and the cut becomes infected and becomes runs rampant, you might end up having to cut your, your, your hand, for example, from a simple cut in the kitchen, for example. Okay, so antibiotic apocalypse is a real thing. And some scientists even say that we are currently entering the antibiotic apocalypse because we have rampant problems with antimicrobial resistance and we don't have a solution for it just now, okay? So right now, no solution, okay? So one um, um, approach that uh, the government, so one of the global uh, movements uh, are taking action is to initiate what we call, what they call the Longitude Prize. And you can Google this uh, and, and see to understand what they're about. But the Longitude Prize is essentially a, an award of 8 million euros, if I'm not mistaken. So each generation, they will try, try to identify what is the biggest problem in the, in the, in the global community, in the world. Masalah apa paling besar? So uh, in the recent Longitude Prize run in 2017, 16, I don't quite remember, 
So this longitude prize, they don't decide on uh, what is the biggest problem. They let the community decide. They let the world decide what is the biggest problem through vote. So out of all of the other problems like green energy, uh, lack of food, lack of space, lack of uh, um, a, a lot of other things, antimicrobial resistance was voted to be the most, the biggest problem in the world right now. So it has become the theme for the Longitude Prize currently. Uh, it's supposed to end in 2020, but they extend it to 2022. I don't remember why, okay? All right, oh, and uh, if you feel like joining this, you can still join, it's 2021, you can join at any time. Uh, by the end of 2022, if they announce you menang, you dapat lah, Emilian. Okay, all right. So uh, moving on. So why do we use Acinetobacter baumannii? So for the project that I've done, the uh, bacterial model that I've used was the Acinetobacter baumannii, which is a useful model for resistance studies. Okay, so a uh, bit of an introduction. Uh, Acinetobacter baumannii is a gram-negative uh, gram cock of bacilli. It's mostly nosocomial. It can cause a crap load of uh, diseases. Pardon my French. It's mostly found in Iraq and then all over the world. It's a big problem. Okay. Uh, so why do we choose Acinetobacter baumannii? Primarily because it has a high propensity for mutations. Basically, fancy way of saying your antipat mutate. All right, and they, due to this uh, high propensity for mutations, they can develop resistances very easily, okay? So we use them as models. Uh, and just a bit of a highlight, they can cause diseases, uh, infectious diseases, depending on the species and depending on where they are, uh, where the site of infection is, from the brain to the blood, to the GI tract, to the urinary tract, the skin, the blah, 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 blah. So uh, if, you, if you have uh, like a good enough constitution, you can Google uh, Acinetobacter baumannii skin, uh, I forgot what the term is called, uh, uh, fasciitis. So there are certain cases where patients' skin had to be removed because they were heavily infected with Acinetobacter and could not be saved. So memang kulit kena buang, nampak all the muscle muscle, which is very gross, but very cool. So uh, looking into the DNA, you all know about this by now. So the, the, the causes of mutation in uh, DNA that results in antimicrobial resistance can be a lot of things. Could be due to high occurrence of mobile elements, your transposons, your integrons, could be due to resistance islands picked up by other bacteria, or they just so happen to develop their own resistance islands over the course of a few years, maybe. And they uh, could either pick up specific genes from other bacteria as well, or from a vertical transfer. Okay, so in Malaysia, this is an outdated diagram, but the cases of antimicrobial resistance is rising. Uh, the latest you have, you can check for the National Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance in Malaysia. But unfortunately, it's like 2017. They haven't been updating recently. But long story short, antimicrobial resistance is a problem. So uh, the general idea of antimicrobial resistance is that when a pathogen is exposed to a bacterial uh, antibacterial, they die. Okay, but under constant sublethal exposure, the bacteria has time to develop uh, resistances, develop mechanisms to avoid death by these antimicrobials. So constant sublethal exposure basically means that you are exposing the bacteria to concentrations of antimicrobials that are not enough to kill them. So sublethal, just enough to like stress them out, but not kill them. And the resistances can be either due to, um, can be either in the form of phenotypic resistance due to expression, and this can be for, uh, forgotten. The bacteria can, after a while, they forget how to become resistant uh, to that specific drug or mutations, which are irre irreversible. I mean, technically they are irreversible, but less likely. And you have bistability where the bacteria has a colony that contains both a subset of resistant strain, the wild type, uh, sorry, the mutant type, and the wild type where the parents are not uh, resistant. They have reasons for that due to like maybe metabolic, uh, to, to conserve metabolic uh, resources. So the general idea in the project in the application of the anti, um, discovering antimicrobial resistance, basically you start with your parent strain here on the left, and then you expose them, you break them off into four or how many, uh, sub, uh, how many daughter strains that you like. You expose, the, you expose the daughter strains to your antibiotic of choice. In this case, it's C for ciprofloxacin, E for erythromycin, M for meripenem, I for imipenem, okay? And then you uh, sequence the parent, you get you uh, send your DNA, your parents, uh, your parents, your parents, I think the parent strain to the uh, sequencer. You get the genome, then you sequence the daughter strains after you've gained resistance, right? 
and then you backtrack and identify where exactly does those mutation occur. So when you do this, you will get a nice uh, map of the evolution. And at the same time, in our project, what we've done is we've compared the in vitro resistant strains with the clinical strains to see if the in vitro condition can develop resistances similar to the clinical uh, setting. So let's say clinical setting are the meropenem resistance, and we have in vitro uh, samples that are meropenem resistance. Do they have the same mechanism? Do they apply the same uh, mutations? to get uh, uh, resistance towards meropenem. Because you have to keep in mind that in vitro settings in the lab, it's a controlled environment. So it doesn't really simulate the exact situation in, the, uh, in clinics, in hospitals, okay? So we need to see that what we're doing is applicable in hospitals as well. Otherwise, it's just a very close space and can't really be applied in real life. So how do we run the, the resistance in this case? Uh, we use ciprofloxacin as an example. example. We take our parent strain, and then we passage them into a sub-inhibitory concentration, a sub-lethal dose of 0.5 micrograms per mil. Once they become able to grow in 0.5, we increase the dose to 1.0, then repeat in 2.0, and then repeat, 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 until you get your superbug in hand. All right, so you have your uh, ciprofloxacin resistant uh, acinetobacter albuminii at one to eight micrograms per mil, which is crazy high, okay? So here we've done an antibiogram to determine uh, the resistances of uh, our ciprofloxacin resistant acinetobacter albuminii. That's a mouthful. Now we've analyzed this to get the, uh, to, to diagnose whether or not that these, uh, the, the strains are indeed resistant, intermediate or susceptible to ciprofloxacin. Okay. And in this particular study, we've, uh, we tried to determine whether uh, the strains, the ciprofloxacin resistant bacteria can retain resistance. It is, is it stable or not? If we store it in four degrees, in minus 80 degrees, and in 37 degrees Celsius, we culture them for a while to see if they can retain the resistance even without exposure to the drug. So we've shown here that even that we've stored them in four degrees Celsius for an extended period of time or minus 80 degrees Celsius for an extended period of time, or we just grow them as is, they will not lose their resistance. But if you notice on the top here, for gentamicin resistance, the resistance is lost depending on the, uh, the, the condition of storage. Okay, but this is like very, uh, still, still a work in progress. So when we compare between the genome, we have our resistant strain. We want to compare between the susceptible parent and, this, and the resistant um, daughter strain, right? Okay, so here is just a, a brief diagram to show that you can see that there are different mechanisms that can allow for resistance development. So once we've sequenced the bacteria, the parent and the daughter strain, we can submit to the, uh, depending on your, your services that you use. So in the project that we used, I have, um, how should I say this, a bit kiasu. So I tend to uh, prefer to use third-party software over relying on licensed software, primarily because I'm sure you as bioinformatics, uh, bioinformaticians uh, can appreciate that if you have knowledge on how to apply using third-party software, then regardless of how, uh, how the technology improves, you can adapt to the technology, adapt to the software and then run your sequencing analysis at any time without having to pay for licensed software okay so this is rast so rast is an online um, uh, sequencing uh, and sequence annotation uh, service that you can just submit and they will give it a bit of time and their servers will analyze for you and they will just multahkan all of the annotation and you will have to analyze on your own okay and this is a uh, data taken from a basis, B-A-S-Y-S, which is another sequencing annotation service, which is also free. So we've run both R-A-S-T and B-A-S-Y-S just to compare to see, to, to validate one another, essentially. Uh, and not to say that you are completely uh, required to send um, to, to, to free services to just to deem at cost, right? Uh, if you have the funds and you have licensed software and you have uh, sequence, uh, uh, sequencing service providers that can do the analysis for you, they can do the annotation for you, by all means, see what because it saves a lot of time. So this project was during my PhD, Memang from scratch, I have to develop, I'm gonna develop that. I have to learn one by one from the sequencing to the annotation to the, the so on and so forth. So it's good experience. I can do the annotation anytime I want without relying on licensed software, but it's quite time consuming. Okay, so now you have your daughter straight and your parent straight. You compare between the two and you take, for example, in this case, ciprofloxacin. So you add a 
few mutations. This is just a small window of the mutations that we have determined. So here, uh, group A collagen's tolerance protein here, sorry, you can see that there's a rampant amount of mutations occurring in a single gene, in a single protein. So that positions 1159, 1136, 1124, 1106, 1097, 1091, blah, 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 blah. So in a single gene, uh, various amounts of mutations have been occurring and likely to prevent the bacteria from being, being uh, from uptaking the antimicrobial, the ciprofloxacin in the first place. So TOLA, uh, if I'm not mistaken, might be a, a toll gene, as the name implies. So it's basically like a gate protein that allows bacteria to either um, kick out uh, antimicrobials after they've passed through the cell membrane or prevent the antimicrobial from entering the bacteria in the first place. So these are just some examples. There are many various ways that the bacteria can evolve and mutate to pre prevent uh, antimicrobials from taking effect, okay? So this is an example of uh, quote unquote structural analysis. So I use the term structural at this time a bit loosely. So we don't actually look at the structure of the DNA, more of the order of the genes that are present. So what we show here are number one, there are small clusters of surface related genes in this uh, uh, upper section here in the forward strand. So we have sequences for phosphorylation, efflux, efflux, and OMP. So this particular cluster of genes actually control the input and output of uh, the uh, antimicrobials or any substances into the cell. And on the other hand, down here, number two, we've noticed a cluster of signaling resistance and regulation clustered together, uh, suggesting that the bacteria have clustered uh, resistance uh, genes to, in one place in order to help them regulate them better. So when they upregulate, after they express more of one resistant gene, they regulate the entire cluster to make it easier for them to control, okay? So we've identified several unique mutations. Number one, for example, in the MEXB, in the uh, meropenem resistant strain, compared to all the other uh, samples that we have, this particular mutation occurs in 542 from cytosine to thymine. And of course, this one for ABRM M sample M9 from guanine to thymine, and this one SRRA gene in re erythromycin resistant strain from th cytosine to thiamine. So some samples develop unique mutations in specific genes that other samples do not. So this is very interesting to us. Okay. So uh, a bit of an overview of the re resistance induction. So this is just a, uh, a diagram of how we increase the antimicrobial resistance dosage. So the red line here is the breakpoint to determine mengatakan it is resistant, right? Okay, so here uh, you can tell that the ciprofloxacin, bakiri atas ni, ABRC, highly resistant, you cannot even see the red line. And for ABRE, erythromycin, you can't even see the red line other than the red line indicating the concentration. For meropenem and impenem, it's a bit difficult to get the resistance because essentially uh, the breakpoint is higher and Meropenem, impenem being uh, last resort drugs, it's more difficult to get resistance towards them. Uh, so we, we've done some antibiograms to confirm. And we've determined that in ABRC, ABRE, ABRM, and ABRI, uh, there are 23, 20, 16, and 19 variations, all discovered through the use of genome sequencing. And then we compare the genome of the parent strain and the daughter strain, all right? And then we've pinpointed the relevant mutations that occur in ABRC to two, ABRE to four, ABRM to four, ABRI to four. And I won't go into detail one by one. Uh, what you need to know is these are what we have narrowed down from the entire genome of the four megabase pairs of the bacteria. So uh, from the mutation, we've designed PCR primers and then we backtracked uh, the, uh, the, the, the sample that we've collected daily. So this is about 50 day, 60 day, wait, no, it's 80 days, about 80 days of, of, of sampling. And then we designed the primers and we uh, targeted the, 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 the gene that we have determined that carries the mutation. So here in ABRC, we, carry, uh, we, we determined that mutations for gyrase A occurs in, on day 26, mutation on YIHG occurs in day 48. For ABRE, early on, on day four and day five, the bacteria has evolved uh, mutations, have developed mutations in signaling genes, PVGS and SRRA. And at the end of it, in between here, between day five and day 67, no relevant mutations were found. But at day 67, penicillin binding and regulation mutations were determined at day 67. 
We've also uh, done this on ABRM, and day four, the mutation on biofilm was developed first, and then followed by the efflux uh, pump protein max B, and then no relevant mutations to our knowledge until day 70, where the metabolic activity is mutated. Uh, for ABRI, which is also a carbapenem uh, drug, at day 19, penicillin binding mutation at FTSI1 was uh, de detected, and at day 38, efflux pump ACRB component was detected, and there's a mutation there. And at day 67, penicillin binding uh, gene uh, was detected to have a mutation in the 1544 position. So this is just another diagram just to show, uh, just to correlate between the uh, day of mutation, the day of exposure, the concentration of the drug, and the occurrence, the first occurrence of the mutation. So here at day 26, a concentration of about 64 micrograms per mil, the first mutation was detected at day 24 at position for gyrase A, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so here we can tell that uh, between days around 15 to 26, there's no mutation that's occurring. So it takes about six, five, about seven, seven, eight, nine days of exposure to the same concentration of the drug, and then you can see a mutation occurring. So you need the constant exposure to that particular uh, antimicrobial for mutations to occur. So we've done um, uh, multiple sequence uh, alignment analysis on this. So we've determined that at extended exposure of low concentrations of ciprofosaxin, no mutations were uh, was detected. So regardless, we have a sample that's resistant to 2.0 micrograms per mil. Uh, but even if we grow that at 2.0 micrograms per mil for extended period of, a period of time, even at the, the end there, there won't be a mutation. However, once you increase to 64 or 128, and then the bacteria will be compelled to mutate at position 242 in this particular gyrus AG. Okay, so we need to say using the, the PCR from the, that we designed using the genomic analysis, we determined low exposure, low concentration, extended period is not enough to induce resistance. It must be high concentration, extended period, and then it will induce mutation. So that type of selective pressure is needed to induce mutation in bacteria. And then we've uh, translated the, protein the, the DNA sequence into protein sequence, and then we determined that there's a polar, uh, and there's changed from a polar uncharged amino acid to a hydrophobic amino acid. So this will uh, uh, intensely, significantly affect the property of the protein because you're changing the amino acid properties rather than just changing the size or the shape. Okay, so this will change how the bacteria, how the gyrus A react to its surroundings. We've also done some bi-stability analysis. So this one is very simple, Sajik, the grow, and then we determine how uh, the bacteria sustains bistable uh, cultures. So if, if you can see the red uh, semicircle there indicates a resistant uh, mutant, and the blue semicircle indicates a, a, a susceptible wild type. So in most cases, uh, the bistability is temporary after a while, it, the colony is entirely replaced, the culture is entirely replaced with a uh, homozygous or homogeneous um, uh, strain of resistant uh, bacteria. But in some cases, the bistable mutants, the culture will constantly maintain a group of bacteria that carries the mutation and another group of bacteria that doesn't carry the mutation together within that colony. So rather than one uh, colony, one subset overtaking the other, both subsets work together to survive. So this is very interesting to us. All right, so just a bit of an overview. We compared our sequences with one another and we determined that uh, different mutations were detected regardless of the resistances present, uh, the combinations of mutations, combinations of genes present are also different. So here you can see HAAB16 is resistant, but it carries only uh, beta-lactamase OXA10, whereas 21, 22, 23, 17, 18, 18, and so on and so forth carries three genes rather than just one. So it shows that HAB16 needs only one gene to have resistance against beta-lactam. So we've done this for meropenem resistance as well, and you can see the same profile, but in general, most of them need at least two genes. Uh, they need the MEX-B and the MEX-B group two, group one and group two to, ab to be able to sustain resistance, okay? So this is all done because we screened the entire genome, and then we 
compared the genome of all these 25 samples, then we determined uh, what genes are present and whether or not they are relevant in antimicrobial resistance. So for erythromycin resistance, you can see this is a small, a small number here. Uh, we've targeted for SRRG, uh, SRRA genes. And some, uh, interestingly, uh, a susceptible strain, AB00, uh, carries the SRRA, but it does not carry resistance towards uh, this particular uh, antimicrobial. So it suggests that SRRA plays a role in resistance, but not significantly. There are other mechanisms that we have yet to unearth and dis uh, to discover to determine what exactly is causing erythromycin resistance in that timeline. Okay. So in conclusion, essentially, I have a bit of a So okay, we've uh, elucidated the path of resistance. We created a roadmap to determine how the bacteria on a day-to-day -day basis, what mutations they carry out one by one in order to develop resistances against various types of antimicrobials, okay? And we compared this with clinical uh, samples as well to determine that, yes, while we do this in an individual setting, it does carry uh, weight to clinical setting as well. So this is something that you have to take in mind as well because a lot of clinical experts, whenever you run analysis for them, you check out resistance, the important and so on and so forth, they will say, so what? Upper relevant in a clinical uh, setting. So this is something you have to keep in mind. So while we, as bioinformaticians, as microbiologists, we like to study fundamental sciences, fundamental aspects of why resistances occur, there are other aspects of people, uh, there are other um, uh, departments in this case that will require the clinical significance. If we have all of these mutations, so what? Okay, so that's why we uh, compare them with the clinical strains as well some references if you're interested. And again, if you're interested to apply uh, to, to develop new ideas or innovation for the, uh, the, the, the longitude prize, then feel free to introduce, introduce this to your lecturers who knows they have ideas in mind to develop uh, new detection kits and such and so on and so forth. And just to keep in mind, a bit of a promotion to Cassini, commercial escape. Uh, the project that we have going on here for the antimicrobial resistance is actually still ongoing. We have grants for this that uh, require work to be done. And I would be more than happy to have, if, if any of you require any industrial training or experiences or would like to try out, uh, I would be more than happy to take up a few students to practice and learn and, and help me uh, study more of the genome sequences that we have in stock. And that is all for me. I think I have, I'm good on time. Yes, I'm good on time. All right. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Izwan Ismail, for the very informative sharing. Hopefully, all of the audience managed to gain additional knowledge from this session. Next, we will proceed with a Q&A session. To fellow audience, again, if you have any questions regarding the session, you are very much welcome to open your microphone and or ask questions in the chat box. I think there are one questions uh, in the chat, Doctor. Okay. So the question is, um, some of uh, some of the findings documented that probiotics might cause antibiotic resistance too. So may I know how far these findings are true? What do you think? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Hui Mei. Okay, so uh, this is relatively new and a colleague of mine have also introduced me to this concept whereby uh, probiotics carry resistance genes that can result in uh, a bit of a haywire in like your system, right? So uh, to my knowledge, this particular information is relatively new and people are still trying to discover uh, why exactly do probiotics carry resistance genes and in other aspects on application aspects, is it possible for us to give resistances to probiotics. Why do we need this? It's because if we can give resistances to probiotics, so every time we get sick, we have a, we have a let's say, gastrointestinal distress, we take pro, uh, antibiotics, the probiotics will not be affected by the antibiotics, and only the bacteria, the pathogens that are causing the disease will be flushed out. So this particular type of study is still, is still in its, uh, I, I don't wanna say infancy, but it's still in the early stages of, of a study. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's a very good point. That's a very topical, topical point. Uh, thank you so much for the question. 
Okay, doctor. So second question from Siti Nurmaida. Doctor, may I know how long does it take for uh, the Abomani project to finish and what kind of software bioinformatic tools we use in this project? Okay, that's a very good point, uh, Siti Nurmaida. Uh, so it depends. Uh, as you can see, the mutations from the timeline that we've developed, the first mutation occur as early as four days. So four days, five days, you already have some mutations occurring. Uh, but if you want to go further, it depends on the scope of your project. So our project was to determine if we can induce resistance. So we have a naive, we have a parent strain that cannot fight off antibacteria. Then we introduce it to antibacterial slowly until it learns how to uh, resist the antibacterial. So it falls, um, uh, it goes down to what antibacterial you're using. If you're using an antibacterial that is easier for the bacteria to resist, then your project will be very quick. It can be done like one month, maybe two weeks, depending. But for example, if you use uh, hardy drugs like meropenem, impenem, and ciprofloxacin, for example, uh, so it might take you at least a month, but that one is also a bit optimistic. So the, the project, in my experience, uh, even up until like 60 to 70 days, two to three months, almost three months, uh, it's, we've only managed to be, to be able to get the resistance up to the threshold level, up to the minimum inhibitory concentration. So it's not quite as resistant as we would like. Uh, so we, if we extended the project further, we could get even stronger superbugs that can resist the neuropenem impenem. So again, depends on the scope of your study. If you, uh, if you feel that you have time, uh, then you should try to go for antibiotics that are more difficult for the bacteria to develop resistances. So these types of resistances will be much more relevant to the clinical setting. So because meropenem and impenem, as I mentioned, are third, um, uh, third class, eh? that there are the last resort drugs. Last resort drugs, meaning to say, doctors will not give you this type of drug, will not give you this antibiotics, unless all of the other antibiotics are not working. So they give you erythromycin, they give you ciprofloxacin, they give you skeskeskin, and the bacteria is not going away. And then they will give you the meropenem or mepenem. So it's a last resort. So the reason why we use last resort uh, drugs is because we don't want uh, to use them too early. Otherwise, the bacteria will start to learn how to fight against these antibacterials early on. And since those are our last resort drugs, if they already learn to fight those uh, antibacterials, then we have nothing on our arsenal anymore. Then all that's left for you to do is just to, uh, to, to be entirely honest, just rest and berdoa sajalah, basically. Okay? Uh, so depending on your project, if you use ciprofloxacin targeting the DNA, it might be a bit faster. If you use erythromycin, targeting protein synthesis, it might be faster. If you use meropenem, impenem, it might take a bit longer. But it will not take you years, hopefully. Hopefully, it will not take you years. But speaking of which, uh, if you are interested, there is a study, uh, a long form evolution study on E. coli that's been carried out for decades. It's been going on for on a daily basis for decades and decades. So if you Google uh, E. coli evolution study, this will pop up. And the study is still ongoing right now, even though the pandemic tengah COVID ni, it's still ongoing. And they have managed to discover that even without the introduction of drugs, the E. coli has learned to pick up new substrates to use in their digestion. So substrate that they initially cannot use, they don't know how to use. But one day the, 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 uh, the, the researcher discovered that there's a change of the turbidity in the, in the flask and they determined that, oh, turns out this bacteria, we, we introduced one substrate. For the previous tens of years in generation, it's not using. Suddenly today, it started to use. So even without the introduction of any drugs, the bacteria is able to uh, develop new mutations to make the best use of its environment. Okay, so uh, if you like fight the project, to you pilih uh, antimicrobial yang uh, senang untuk resistant. If you have the time, pilih yang panjang sikit pun tak apa. It's more relevant. It's more interesting to study. Thank you for the question. Okay, doctor. Another question from Dr. Gohuhan. How do you define the breakpoints for different antibiotics and are the mutations common to previous studies of other bacteria? Perhaps you can also share about why safety precautions in place for working with superbugs. Okay, thank you very much for the question, uh, Associate Professor Go. So for the breakpoints, um, to my knowledge, there are two methods for you to determine. Uh, well, technically four, two by two. 
uh, you can use either antibiograms, which is the, the little discs I showed you just now, or you can use my minimum inhibitory concentration where you grow them in, um, in like bottles and cultures in liquid form. Uh, so if you grow them and then we measure, if in, this, uh, in the discs, we measure the diameter of clear zone, and in the minimum inhibitory concentration, we measure their OD, their optical density. So in these two situations, depending on what sample that you have, uh, we will compare them to a gold standard. We have the UCAST breakpoint or the uh, CLSI breakpoint. So in most cases, in my project especially, we use UCAST primarily because it's freely available. There's no need to pay. CLSI is, I, I understand, to be more extensive, but it is paid. So uh, in order to save costs there, we just use a UCAST. So for the Malaysian uh, National Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance, they do this to track antimicrobial resistance, but uh, unfortunately they stopped at 2017, I don't know why. So even for the Malaysian uh, NSAR, they used the UCAST breakpoint. So this is the globally accepted standard to determine, yes, the, for example, Acinetobacter baumannii is resistant towards, for example, ciprofloxacin at so and so concentration based on UCAST breakpoint standards. Yes. So um, that's to answer the first question. The second is, are the mutations common to previous studies? Uh, so the thing about studying bacterial mutations, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Typically, evolution type studies, it's uh, it's no guarantee that you will get the same results. Uh, when you repeat the experiment. So that's why when I ran the experiment in my PhD, uh, we just ran four at once. And that took up entire, my entire day, every day for two, three months. So uh, bangun pagi, balik malam pagi buta. But you get to run the experiment in one go. So who's to say, if I were to repeat the experiment using the parent strain again, we might not get the same results because as evolution dictates, there's many factors that, that come into play. Uh, but in terms of the types of uh, genes that are relevant for uh, the, the, the resistances. Uh, this one, I've, I've left that, that, uh, the, the information for quite some time. So I'm very sorry, I, I can't really answer you uh, in the, uh, to be more specific. Uh, but generally, we, I don't think we have a database that compiles all, compiles all of those things. So um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I can't give you a straight answer for that one. <laughs> Uh, but I'll, I'll try to, to look into it in the future, okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Go. Um, so the third point that Dr. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Go mentioned, perhaps can also share about the biosafety precautions. Um, Precaution-wise, well, I have to say, it's a lot safer than COVID <laughs> because it's not, um, it's not airborne. It's not really something that you can get infected through touch and whatnot, although technically you can. Uh, so it's, it's level two is sufficient. It's below mycobacterium, it's below TB, uh, but we don't really have a uh, standard, um, like, like uh, we don't have a standard for like, if you have a superbug of this particular level, then you need level two, level three, or level four, uh, because superbugs is a broad term. So as long as the bacteria has enough resistances, then we term it as superbug, or we have pen resistant or, and um, extended spectrum resistant. But to my knowledge, uh, we do not have a standard requirement. It's more like if you're handling pathogens, then yes, level two is sufficient, but you have to be careful with the gloves and the masks and everything. But from my perspective, uh, uh, with our experience handling bacteria in the lab, we wear gloves and masks mainly to prevent from contaminating the samples uh, because we were careful enough to not get the sample on us specifically. So my lab code number uh, is So uh, really, to be safe, you can set the standard for your lab. It's not a problem. So if they, let's say you're running experiments on antimicrobial resistance, you can just set up the lab to have level three uh, safety and just set that as the standard. But if you have level two, uh, really there's nobody stopping you, honestly. Yeah. Thank you for the question, doctor. Another question also from Dr. Go. What's the next step to translate your findings into clinical applications? Uh, yes, that's a very good point. Uh, translational studies. Um, so we, as a fundamental uh, researcher, uh, so it's a lot of steps before we get to clinical, but the, uh, the, the closest that we've ever got was the development of uh, detection kits. So we developed uh, through the use of the genome uh, that we have uh, compiled, 
of sequence, and we have a few of the genomes as well, 25 or 26. So we use that to develop, uh, to determine what is the common, um, the, the conserved regions of these local strains. So th these are all clinical strains that are found in Malaysia. So we then identify the uh, conserved regions of these strains, and they compare them to conserved regions of international strains so from the, the, the NCBI database. And then we develop a PCR kits to help uh, researchers and hopefully clinicians to be able to detect that their pathogen is indeed Acinetobacter baumannii. That's one thing, it's very common. People do that all the time. But what we've taken uh, ahead, we've, we've taken one step forward. One of our kits actually incorporates uh, as a multiplex to detect multiple genes that we have screened to be present only in resistant strain. For example, like let's say the SRA or the EPSL. So we compile these to a multiplex uh, PCR. So one PCR, one band can pop up multiple bands that show that yes, your Acinetobacter baumannii can be, has SRA or MEXB or EPSL A. So, and then we have a prepared uh, sort of a diagram to show if you have this combination, then it's likely that your uh, Acinetobacter is resistant against X, Y, and Z. If you have that combination, it could be resistant to A, B, and C. So it would help, hopefully, clinicians to uh, further uh, help them with the diagnostics and help them with the prescription of the drugs. Um, and while I do say that, as a fundamental biologist, we see that as, yes, it will help the world, so on and so forth. But um, if you were to um, uh, look into um, a broader aspect, as economics and politics and, and the management of, of hospital resources and everything. Um, sometimes PCR is not the best choice when it comes to diagnostics because it can cost a bit more. And we, we've discovered this uh, lately when it comes to COVID. So which is why when um, we're detecting COVID, is it more efficient to use uh, antibody detection or is it more appropriate to use PCR? Well, antibody is less, uh, how do you call that, less specific. So you can detect a broad spectrum of, of the conditions in the host. It is also uh, a lot quicker to detect so that you can control them. You can control the in infections, uh, the spread quickly, but it can also uh, be backfire in, in one, one context. So if you use a PCR, for example, it's too specific, whereby even if the host is already recovering from COVID and you use PCR and you see that there's a spike in the, in the, the, in the results, you might say, ah, yes, you're still positive. Where, when in fact, the host is recovering, not carrying an active uh, infection. Um, so for our bacterial studies, we, the only way that we have so far been managed to get closer to clinical application was detection. Uh, so, but whether or not that is entirely applicable, depending on if we can basically cut costs, essentially. So that's something that we as fundamental researchers need to keep in mind. So we need to talk to economists as well. Yeah, thank you for the question, Azir. Um, hello, hello, doctor. Yeah, um, I have a question. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, what is the current applications like of the whole genome sequencing present in Malaysia that's related to microevolution and antimicrobial resistance? It's a very good question. Um, if you ask me, I haven't been like really dogging into the the whole how what what everyone else is doing, which is very bad of me. Uh, currently. Unfortunately, the study of microevolution, the study of antimicrobial resistance in Malaysia is quite lacking, honestly, if you ask me. Uh, so most people, when uh, like the Professor Go mentioned, yes, a lot of researchers are doing a lot of uh, uh, microbe studies, bacterial studies, but most of them are more towards, uh, what do you call that? Profiling. They're just trying to profile, sequence the genome and see what's going on there. That's it. And then, uh, it boils down to <clears throat> funding, essentially. So the government doesn't see the point in funding a lot of research when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. It's very niche. So government belum nampak lagi yang tu. So what the government sees is if they fund microbial projects for agriculture, for things that can produce petroleum, for things that can makan plastic or stuff like that, they see that as more of a more hype lah, uh, more something they can industrialize. So when it comes to health, which is antimicrobial resistance, uh, government dia kurang sikit, dia kurang, kurang nampak sikit, unfortunately. Uh, so, but I should point out that uh, the problem of antimicrobial resistance is a global problem. And since Malaysia is part of the globe, 
So it is a problem that we unfortunately have to face as well. So even though we don't have that many researchers that are currently doing antimicrobial resistance, probably due to understandably, they not fun, so they cannot go into a niche yang orang kurang nak bagi duit. So understandably, so they go towards yang banyak orang bagi duit. Okay, but I more than welcome if you all have interest to study antimicrobial resistance, especially the use of bioinformatics and through the use of combination of third party software, which is very much applicable and third party software are free. The only thing that's not free right now is your time. <laughs> okay, so if you don't have the time, you cannot do the analysis. So if you have the time, you can run the analysis anytime you want. Okay, and of course, hardware also not free. Lah. So when running the 25 genome analysis that I did from my PhD, 25 bacterial genome, the only way I was able to carry that out was because of, we have a very powerful like server, very powerful, a lot more powerful than my laptop at least. To run 25, even then, it might take a few days. Okay, so to run my laptop, mungkin I dah habis PhD dua kali, bawa habis the analysis, I tak tahu lah. Okay, uh, uh, but right now, antimicrobial resistance studies are there, but not so prevalent. Uh, but you, so if you not go for antimicrobial resistance, uh, published paper and all that, people will be very interested to know about that because it's not that much. Okay, thank you for the question, Yap. Okay, Dr. Okay, I think this is the last question from uh, Afika. Is there any medicine or current ways to stop the spread of superbugs? That is the golden question. So, I'll answer this question. Currently, no. <laughs> uh, as currently, there is nothing that can stop antimicrobial resistance. That is what we are trying to figure out. So, to figure that out, we have to determine how the bacteria develop resistances. You not begin perang. You want to go to war. You not prevent your your enemies from getting into your country. You have to know how people get into your country in the first place, right? Uh, what is the 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 the, the marine route, the the, the uh, ground route, the air route? How can we stop all these things? So the reason why we develop a timeline of the evolution of the antimicrobial resistance was to determine what is the preferred route of evolution for the bacteria. So once we determine the root, kita cakap asymptomacter in this species, they prefer, kita bagi, bila kita bagi ciprofloxacin, they prefer mutate DNA dulu, for example. So how do we stop that? How do we prevent it from mutating the DNA? Or maybe kita stop them from flushing it out by, by uh, disabling the uh, efflux pump or something, or introducing adjuvants. So to, to know all of these things, we need to know how they do these things. We need to know how they develop, what do they prefer? So right now, the, the question is, there is no drugs. We have last resort drugs, which is your your carbapenem, lah, your, your third class carbapenem. And I see that sana, colistin, like Shu, Han, Sim mentioned, colistin is the last resort, anti, currently is the last resort one. Some antibiotics that are available, they uh, are used in the past, but no longer used now because they cause adverse effects to the body. Kita makan colistin, polymyxin, which is a type of colistin. Kita makan and then we get like nausea, kita jadi muntah, kita jadi macam, we develop like severe symptoms. So it's not feasible for us to keep using that drug. But since kita tak guna, we, we don't use the drug, bacteria are not, becomes a last resort. We don't want to use it so quickly so that the bacteria can learn. So uh, we don't have, a solution for that right now, but to answer uh, Shu Han's question, is it possible to send the blah 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 blah? Oh no no, uh, Colossian last resort in hospital. Uh, right now, part of the project that I'm doing, the most recent grant that we are working on, is on colistin, is on polymixin. So we are testing to see whether or not it is possible to induce resistance if we bagi swap sikit sikit polymixin dekat bacteria sampai dia pandai nak lawan. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, due to COVID, benda tu tak boleh jalan. Okay. Uh, so, manusia tak pandai lawan COVID lagi, so uh, tak boleh nak ajar bacteria. So, kena tunggu turn. Okay. Alright. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Doctor. I think, uh, thank you for audience for the questions, as well as Dr. Izwan for answering the accuracy of very clear explanations. So, next, we will proceed with our second photography session. Uh, all audience are invited to enable your camera again for the photograph session. Everyone can open your camera. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. One more time. Okay, ready? 
one, two, three, smile. That's all. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your cooperation. That marks the end of our second session and we have come to the end of our webinar. So ladies and gentlemen, as the saying goes, to every beginning, there is an ending. Our industrial webinar, Let's Explore the Next Generation Sequencing has reached the end. Once again, we would like to express our utmost gratitude to both of our speakers for willingly joining us today and lending us your time despite your tight schedule. We appreciate it a lot and I would like to apologize wholeheartedly for any mistakes made unintentionally throughout the event on behalf of the organizing committee. Thank you to all of our great audience for being with us today. It was a pleasure having all of you today. With that being said, as the master of ceremony for today's event, with Wabillahi Taufiq Wal Hidayah, Wassalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Izwan and uh, Dr. Go. Uh, this is uh, Jeff, the coordinator for the course by informatics. Um, I think I think uh, everyone uh, is actually very help. I mean, thankful that both of you have, you know, sacrificed your Saturday for us. Uh, and I, I I find that your you know both your your talks are actually very interesting. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I I have realized that there's actually um, other people apart from the course students. Uh, and if you, I, I mean, I'm sure you can see that in, in the chat group where you know a lot of people find it useful and they would like to sort of um, have the recordings of the webinar. So thank you very much for your sharing session. Uh, hopefully, we can solicit your help or your assistance once again in, in the webinars in the next coming uh, courses. Uh, I think uh, at this uh, juncture, I would just like to sort of acknowledge uh, the whole team behind the webinar. For your information, Dr. Go and uh, Dr. Izwan, the whole procession organization of this webinar is entirely done by the students. And, uh, you know, both myself and the other lecturers have nothing um, uh, actually, you know, we didn't actually meddle around with, 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 with whatever you see today. So I think they did, did a good job. And, you know, especially in actually um, identifying uh, speakers for the webinars, uh, which is yourself and Dr. Go. So, uh, I, I mean, I thank you very much uh, for really the, you know, the sharing session. And hopefully, um, you know, uh, we have about like 70 odd participants today. Uh, hopefully, um, some of them will be the next you know, uh, the pelapis, I would say, for bioinformatics in the, in, in the, um, in, in, in the, in the, in Malaysia lah. And mana tahu, you know, we never know if you are interested, everyone, if you are, if you are, if you are thinking of a postgraduate uh, career down the line, Dr. Izwan and Dr. Go, I'm sure, you know, uh, I mean, we can, can actually uh, give you options for that. Yes, so feel free to... So. I'm more yeah, than welcome so, if any of you want to, to apply your bioinformatics knowledge to bacterial whole genome analysis or even PCR design, I'm more than happy to, to share and supervise or stuff like that. It's not a problem. More than welcome. There you go. Yep. So, I, and also for those uh, who, who want to take up the challenge, but there is one on that, um, you know, the, the, the 7 million euro um, prize, feel free mm -hmm. to contact Dr. Izwan as well. Uh, so, but again, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Izwan and Dr. Go, for, for today. Uh, looking forward to my, uh, many more you know, um, collaborations in, in the future. Thank okay. you. Uh, and also thank you to the team as well for the webinar. Right, thank you, everyone. Good job semua. Boleh lari hat. <laughs>